chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. So this past Easter Sunday, uh, for our youth Sunday school class, I talked about part of Matthew's resurrection story. And that evening, for evening prayer, I talked about part of Luke's resurrection story. And so tonight I'd like to look at part of John's uh, resurrection story. Uh, These are all options in the lectionary for this week. Uh, Over the past few weeks and uh, and months, really, I've been on kind of a true crime kick, uh, maybe like many of you. And it's amazing how often in these stories, tragedies have a way of of compounding Uh, so many Missing person stories, for instance, end with everyone eventually deciding that the missing person is probably dead. Uh, Tragedy just coming in waves, kind of the knife going in uh, deeper. And I think there's something like that sense here in John 20. Um, Actually, the exact reverse of the familiar missing person tragedy in this case, Jesus has died, and now he's missing. So, so we have to see how very strange and, and how disturbing this must have been for Mary and Peter and, and John, who are already at their wit's end. Uh, I spent some time on Sunday evening in Luke 24, thinking through the implication of a line from one of the two men on the road to Emmaus. He says, we had hoped that Jesus would be the one to redeem Israel. Uh, In other words, now that he's been killed, we know that he wasn't. The Messiah, they they all think at this point, isn't supposed to die. So the disciples at the beginning of John chapter 20 seem to have had all hope in in everything that they had given themselves over to for the past year or more, completely shattered. And 
Okay, and of course, what they'd hoped in was God's rescue of his people and, and of the world, uh, their own lives. So to, to have seen it go so badly wrong so quickly, uh, Ju- Judas, who was one of us, is, has, has, has killed himself, and now Jesus uh, ha- has been beaten and, and killed. Uh, and, and now this new disturbing mystery on top of all of that, some, someone has taken Jesus' body. I think it's worth spending some time and some imaginative energy to to really put ourselves in the shoes of these people. Not least so that when they meet the risen Jesus, we might feel some measure of of what Luke describes as the disciples' mix of fear and great joy. So I'd like to come at this turn in the story uh, in three ways, by thinking about how John here echoes his earlier story about Lazarus, how John echoes the book of Genesis, and and what John has to say about the relationship between Jesus and his disciples, uh, including we ourselves. So John chapter 20, like the story of Lazarus in John uh, chapter 11, which we discussed a couple of weeks ago, involves a lot of movement of the characters, right? Every, everyone seems to be running. Uh, in the story of Lazarus, the characters' comings and goings, especially of Martha and, and Mary, and this is a different Mary here in John 20, of course, uh, all of those comings and goings are a kind of acting out of their frustration and, and their grief. Martha and Mary uh, both run to where Jesus is and tell him the same thing. If, you, if you'd have done what we thought that you would do, what, what we hoped that you would do, be here, uh, our, our brother would not have died. And we see as the passage unfolds that that story is really about following Jesus, letting him lead us, responding to his call, instead of running around frantically uh, telling him what we think he should do. In John 20, also, everyone's running around. And, and again, in, in their grief, but also in, in confusion. Again, they're looking for Jesus, but not where he is. So Mary runs to find Peter and John, and then Peter and John literally race back to uh, the tomb. Verse 4 is kind of funny if, it's, if this is the same John who's writing. And <clears throat> they don't really know what they're doing uh, or, or, or what's happening or what they should do or where they should go. <clears throat> in the same way that they're running around in the story of Lazarus is settled and focused by Jesus himself in a word about how to walk. Walk in the light, he says, so that you don't stumble. In this story, the risen Jesus says to Mary in verse 17, go to my brothers, the other disciples. Uh, Tells her where to go and, and what to do. Say to them, I am ascending. There may be a lesson here again about our grief. Um, and the running around and the confusion that grief can cause. Uh, when Jesus' disciples are lost and hurt and, and running around in circles, he still speaks to them. He, he tells them how to walk and, and where to go and what to do. Walk in the light and not in the darkness. Follow the light of the world. Be with your brothers in the faith and preach the gospel to them. <clears throat> John, uh, John 11 and John 20 also both involve uh, a, a telling pause for detail about the grave cloths. Uh, Lazarus is raised from the dead. But he comes out of the tomb in, in John eleven forty four with his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped 
with a cloth, and Jesus says, unbind him and let him go. So Lazarus is brought back to life. He's brought back to the same kind of life, it, the world of sin, the world of mortality. And someday Lazarus will die again. But when Peter goes into Jesus' tomb, he sees in chapter 20, verse 6, the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. So Lazarus is alive, but, but still bound. And he still needs help from outside himself. But Jesus is raised to a new kind of life. And as God himself, in person, he demonstrates his complete control over what is happening. And as Paul writes in, in another passage given as an option uh, in the lectionary for Easter, this is Romans 6, 9, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. But John doesn't just reach back a few chapters in his own book. Uh, as he's done throughout his gospel, he reaches all the way back to Genesis. <clears throat> in fact, I think, it's, <clears throat> I think it's possible to read the whole gospel of John as, as a long meditation on and, and recapitulation of the creation story. So we know that John begins his gospel quoting and then expanding and enriching theologically the opening of Genesis. In, in the beginning was, uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's Genesis, right? It's John who's the one who tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Throughout John's gospel, as in the opening chapters of Genesis, days are, are important, what, what day it is and what time of day it is. In, in Genesis 1, uh, God creates man on the sixth day. In John 19, on traditionally Friday, uh, the sixth day, Pilate shows the crowd the beaten Jesus with the words, Behold the man. At the end of the creation week, we read in Genesis, God finished the work he had done. Uh, and from the cross in John 19, we read that Jesus knew that all was finished. And he says as his last words, It is finished. In Genesis, God rested on the seventh day and made it holy, just as Jesus rests uh, in the tomb on what we call Holy Saturday. But John is not just retelling the story of creation, but telling the story of new creation. So in his story, we move beyond the week into a kind of eighth day, uh, a new first day. So John 20 begins, as does Genesis 1, in the dark. And there is a man on whom the fate of all other men rests. In Genesis, Adam, and in John, Jesus. And there is a woman in Genesis, Eve, and in John, Mary Magdalene. And we're cued to think of this scene in this way by this strange little detail in verse 15. When Mary sees Jesus and doesn't recognize him, John says she supposed him to be the gardener, uh, which as someone has said, is the right mistake to make. A new Adam. Uh, as Paul says in Romans 5, verse 18, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by the one man, Adam's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man, Jesus' obedience, the many will be made righteous. 
So one more thought that sort of brings our other two together, uh, thinking about how Jesus leads his disciples and, and thinking about how God, through Christ, <clears throat> completes his work of reconciling the world to himself. We find more interesting language in John 20. <clears throat> Throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus uh, often refers to God as the Father. But there's this emphatic new intimacy here in chapter 20 when Jesus tells Mary in verse 17, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God, and calls the disciples my brothers. It is only in Christ, our brother, that we can truly have God as our Father. So <clears throat> this Easter season, wherever we are on the gamut of emotions represented by the disciples in our uh, frustration or, or grief or confusion, may we listen to him, uh, follow the light of the world and, and not stumble. Um, pause and, and, and hear him tell us what to do. May we trust that the God who began the good work of creation and brought it to fulfillment in Christ will, as Paul says in Philippians 1, bring to completion the good work that he has begun in us. And may we know God ever more closely as our Father and Christ as our brother, that we may say with Mary, I have seen the Lord. Amen. The order for Compline. The Lord Almighty grant us a peaceful night and a perfect end. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty God and Father, we confess to you, to one another, and to the whole company of heaven that we have sinned through our own fault in thought and word and deed and in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, raise us up to serve you in newness of life. To the glory of your name, amen. May Almighty God grant us forgiveness of all our sins and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit, amen. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Psalm 134. Behold now, praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. You did stand by night in the house of the Lord, even in the courts of the house of our God. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and sing praises unto the Lord. The Lord who made heaven and earth give you blessing out of Zion. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. A reading from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. For you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth. Keep me, O Lord, as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, hear our prayer and let our cry come to you. Let us pray. Visit this place, O Lord, and drive far from it all snares of the enemy. 
Let your holy angels dwell with us to preserve us in peace. And let your blessing be upon us always through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord. And by your great mercy, defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Be present, O merciful God, and protect us through the hours of this night, so that we who are wearied by the changes and chances of this life may rest in your eternal changelessness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Look down, O Lord, from your heavenly throne. Illumine this night with your celestial brightness, and from the children of light banish the deeds of darkness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night, and give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ, and give rest to the weary. Bless the dying, soothe the suffering, pity the afflicted, shield the joyous, and all for your love's sake. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us this night and evermore. <laughs>